All right, so let's prove that there is no rational number whose square is 12. And I don't know, I think this exercise like in and of itself, it's not that interesting. Like, okay, uh, so square root of 12 is irrational, who cares? Well, it's not so much this fact, but I think this is more of a good introduction to the idea of taking a proof and trying to abstract it as much as possible and sort of get the most bang for your buck when you write a proof. So what you want to do for this problem is, like if you're completely lost and you don't even know where to get started, you know that earlier in the chapter, um, uh, Rudin proves that there's no rational number whose square is two. And so what you should do is you should look at that proof and be like, okay, well let's replace, instead of proving that there's no rational number whose square is 2, let's take that 2 and replace it with 12 and see what else in the proof needs to change. Sort of um, see what you can do to sort of adapt that proof to this sort of problem. Um, and if you do that, you can sort of start to see what is it about the numbers 2 and 12 that allow you to do this sort of proof. And once you know that, you can start to see how you would prove this for more numbers. Like instead of saying two or just 12 or proving it for other numbers, you could start to try to prove it for classes of numbers um, or sets of numbers, whatever. I'm not a logician. Um, but anyways, so let's start out the same way that we do in that example. So we will assume for contradiction um, that there exists a rational number a over b, in, which is uh, it's rational, so it's in this the rational numbers. And we assume here, so b is not zero, and we also assume that a over b is completely reduced. There's nothing we can factor out of either side. Um, anyway, such that, a over b, if we square it, we'll get 12. Okay, and we want to arrive at a contradiction. And um, what happened in the proof in the book is that we prove that 2 divides both a and b, which contradicts the fact that this fraction a over b is irreducible. And so we want to do a similar idea here we want to find something which divides both A and B. Because if we can find something that has to divide both A and B, then that contradicts the fact that A over B is a reduced fraction. So again, we want to write out, you, you want to bring the denominator to the other side. So we write A squared equals 12 times B squared. And let's write this out as, so this is 2 times 2 times 3 times b squared. Okay, so if a squared is 12 times b squared, then a squared is 12 times something, so 12 must divide a squared, or a squared is divisible by 12. Um, see here, i.e. again 2 times 2 times 3 divides a squared. Okay, so in the in the textbook you look at the exercise or you look at the proof that there's that the square root of 2 is irrational and from here you say oh well 2 divides a squared so that means that 2 must divide a which means that 4 must divide a squared and then you get your contradiction from there. Um, because you sort of, you, you sort of, you start in the textbook, you start with two divides a squared, and then you get two divides a, and then you get four divides a squared. And this four here, this gives you more information than you had before in the textbook. In this particular proof, we don't really get any more information this way because we already know okay so 12 well 2 times 2 times 3 divides a squared 
So that means that 2 divides a squared, which means 2 divides a, which means that 4 divides a squared, because 4 is just 2 squared. So if you want to write another step here, so this is 2 squared divides a squared, and that implies that 4 divides a squared, because 2 squared is 4. But in our, in our exercise here, that doesn't really give us any more information. Um, so what else can we do? Well, let's look at 3 instead. So if we know that 3 divides a squared, and in order for 3 to divide a squared, that must mean that 3 divides a. Um, and so, oh, well... Yeah, 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 because we know that there's no... There's no integers. There's no integer that you can square and get f three. And the way to prove that is you could just sort of test them out. Like zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is four, so that's no good. And negative one squared is one, and negative two squared is four, and so you're no good there. And if you try a bigger number, then it's going to be much larger than three, so you're already out of luck. And so just by sort of brute force, brute force, you know that if 3 divides a squared, then 3 must divide a. So if 3 divides a, then 3 squared must divide a squared, and thus 9 divides a squared. Okay, so this is new information. We didn't know, when, when we started with this expression here, we didn't know that 9 divided a squared, but now we know that. Okay, so 9 divides a squared. So let's write this. So then um, if you take um, 4 thirds b squared, well what is this? This is the same as 12 b squared over 9, right? Because to get from the one on the right to the one on the left, you just, fact, you just bring the 12 over 9 out front and you reduce that to 4 over 3 by canceling out 3. Okay, so 12 b squared over 9, but that's 12b squared is a squared, so this is equal to a squared over b, and we know, no, ugh, my 9 was flipped, it was rotated 180 degrees, or pi radians. Anyways, so, um, a squared, so this is equal to a squared over 9, but we know that 9 divides a squared, so this must be an integer. Okay. So 4 thirds times b squared is an integer. How can that be? Well, we've got a 3 in the denominator here. So then 3 must divide b squared evenly because 3 must divide. So if we want another step, this is 4b squared over 3. So 3 must divide 4b squared. And 3 certainly doesn't divide 4, so it must divide b squared. Okay, so 3 divides b squared, but as before, how can this happen? That means that 3 must divide b. So we have shown that 3 divides a and b. But this contradicts the fact that the fraction a over b was chosen to be irreducible. And hence, um, no such a over b exists i.e. there is no rational number such that you square that rational number and you get 12. Okay, so now looking a little more big picture here, what, what do we notice? So what's really happening here? In both proofs, what we used was we took a squared and we proved that this number, we found a number which divides a squared and we took the uh, factor, we, we factored this number into primes and we got 2 times 2 times 3 divides a squared. And so what did we do from there? We took, we, we found that there is a particular prime number which only divides 
a square where where um just one power of that prime divides a squared i.e so here we have three divides a squared but there's only one factor of three divides a squared we don't know that we don't know if two factors of three divide a squared so I think what you can do is um, I claim the square root of um, PQ or PN is irrational if N if P is prime and what else do we have? n does not divide, or p does not divide n. So there is a, so if you're taking the, the square root of an integer, which contains, which when you factor it out, one of the primes has power 1, then it's, the, no such rational exists. And I think this is true. Um, let's, let's, Let's sort of look at this, because um, I'm sort of curious. So, um, let's assume for contradiction, a over b squared equals pn, then a squared equals um, pn b squared. So then what? Then we do sort of the same thing. So we get p times n divides a squared so then p must divide a squared so then p so then in order for p to divide a squared p must divide a so then p squared divides a squared as well so then what next we take um we take p and b squared and we divide by So what do we have as an integer? We have, if we take if we take a squared and we divide p squared, we get an integer, i.e. the integers contain this element, a squared over p squared, but this can be written as p and b squared over p squared, and now we can cancel the p's, and so we get p, um, n times b squared divides p. Now we prove that we 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 we've assumed that p does not divide n. P does not divide n, so p divides b squared. So then again, p divides b. So um, p divides both a and b, and this is a contradiction. That this is a this is a way that some people sometimes will write contradiction. It's just two arrows pointing at each other. But yeah, look at this. We've we found a contradiction because we've proven that a over b is not irreducible. Um, there, there's the the prime number p divides them. So hence, p over n is irrational. And so this is this is why this sort of um, this this is why this sort of proof is important because you want to think about the structure of a proof and you want to think what what are the essential facts of this proof that make it work and how can we s sort of strip out some of the more specific details to get a more powerful proof so instead of just proving that there's no rational whose square is 2 or whose square is 12 we know that if you if you take any product of um, if you take any product like you have p1 to the n1 times p2 to the n2 times all the way up to pn or pm to the nm where p each pi is prime and each ni is um, some positive power um, so we'll say each ni is greater than or equal to 1 so if you've got some integer of this form any integer can be written in this form because of prime factorization and so if you take any integer n, no, m, k, 
any integer k of this form, then if any pi has power, and of course the pi's are all distinct, so none, no two of them are the same. So if you write any integer like this, if any one of these exponents is one, then the square root of k is irrational. Um, so if you take three and multiply it by any combination of prime numbers which are not three, then that's irrational. So let's see here, so three, square root of three is irrational. Three times, let's say three times two is six, so square root of six is irrational. If you take three times, two times two is four, um, eight, three, so square root of 12. If you take three and you multiply by five, um, square root of 15 is irrational. So we have like, we have, we know so much more about when square roots are irrational now from proving this claim. And so this is a technique that we will, that, that will definitely be useful more down the road because this is a very common thing in textbooks. A textbook will prove a fact and then the textbook will ask you in the exercises to prove a very similar fact. And it turns out these two proofs, the one in the textbook and the one listed in the exercises are both specific examples of a more general rule. And by comparing the exercise solution to the proof in the book, you sort of see the overarching structure where these proofs are coming from. And this is really powerful in mathematics as a whole. And that's why this problem is interesting, aside from just um, telling us when square roots are irrational, because that in and of itself, I don't think is very interesting. But I think, I think the structure is. So yeah, there you go.